Uh, good afternoon. You're all very welcome. Um, I feel sure that uh, some of you will appreciate, as I do myself, uh, the indication to switch off your mobile phones for the duration of the presentation. <coughs> um, the event today is uh, jointly organized by the Institute and the Normandy for Peace World Forum. Uh, it's a kind of prelude to uh, the uh, uh, conference of the Normandy for Peace World Forum, uh, which takes place in uh, Caen, I think, at the beginning of June. Uh, the theme of it being this year, the peacemakers, which is very appropriate for uh, the two eminent guests of honor we have today. Uh, Sergio Jaramillo Caro, uh, who is the former uh, EU Special Envoy for the peace process in Colombia. No, I'm sorry, that's, that's, right. that's, that's uh, Emin. <laughs> I'm sorry, the former High Commissioner for Peace in Colombia. And Eamon uh, Gilmore, who doesn't really need any introduction but should be in introduced uh, correctly <laughs> as the former EU Special Envoy for the peace process in Colombia. Uh, the um, organization of this uh, will be that um, both uh, Senor Jaramillo and uh, Mr. Gilmore uh, will each speak for 10 to 15 minutes, and this will be on the record, and then we'll have a question and answer session afterwards, which will be off the record, that's to say, uh, whatever you say here uh, can be uh, used by you, but not uh, assigned this place out to the speaker uh, who uh, delivered the question or the answer. Uh, the uh, Colombian conflict we were talking a bit about beforehand uh, was a very complicated uh, conflict. According to uh, Lawyers Without Borders Canada, in the course of it, 265 1,000 people were murdered. Uh, there were over 46,000 cases of forced disappearance. Uh, there were nearly 7 million displaced persons, 28,000 victims of kidnapping, uh, nearly 11,000 killed or injured by anti-personnel mines, uh, nearly 15,000 victims of sexual violence, and nearly 8,000 forcibly recruited minors. Uh, as well as some 10,000 cases of torture. So, uh, like many uh, conflicts, its roots go uh, far back. Some people talk about 1948, others talk about uh, the 60s, which at any rate, we know here that the historical roots of such conflicts are very deep. Uh, the uh, peace process uh, was concluded uh, in 2016, was it? Uh, with uh, an agreement um, which uh, was also uh, quite a complicated affair, but then uh, we have uh, experience of this here also. Uh, as we were saying earlier, um, in one sense, uh, all conflicts and all the resolutions are unique, but in another sense, and an important sense, uh, there are parallels, and one of the important ones, as far as we're concerned here today, is uh, the international element in the resolution. Uh, I say important uh, here today because one of our speakers is our former foreign minister who played an important role. So uh, without going any further on this, can I ask, um, is Sergio, will you speak first? Uh, yeah. 10, 15 minutes. Yeah. Yes, you're very welcome. <coughs> Well, um, once again, thank you very much uh, indeed for this invitation. As we mentioned at lunch, we've been planning this event with Eamon for, for some time. So thank you to the Institute and all those who helped, uh, Sophie in particular, who had to put up with all our uh, logistical problems. Um, I actually think we're uh, uh, at the high point of Colombian 
Ireland uh, relations, because we, as you, some of you may know, we now have uh, um, embassies, ambassadors. I salute our Patricia, who's our first ambassador ever to Ireland. Uh, but also, what some may not know is that Ireland actually played its own, uh, certainly not insignificant role in the peace process when we were negotiating in Havana. Uh, some of your diplomats would come to visit. We had this great ambassador to Mexico and Colombia, uh, Sonia Highland, and um, the Secretary General of the Ministry, Niall Burgess, came to see us once. Always very interested, always very willing to support. Uh, last year, no, two years ago, we had your president come to Colombia, Michael Higgins. I had to, as peace commissioner, I took him to one of the camps where the FARC were laying down their weapons, and he gave a fabulous and forceful speech encouraging them in their new life. But uh, certainly, uh, by far, the largest contribution that Ireland has made has been the contribution of, of this man to my left, who, who was really... Um, played an extremely important role um, for peace in Colombia, but I think also, as we were discussing at lunch, um, in creating a way for the EU to be more effective in the way it engages with peace process. So uh, I take advantage of the opportunity to thank you once again, Eamon. We Colombians really are all, and will be all forever in your debt. So uh, I won't give you too much background. You've heard a few figures already. I mean, Colombia's was the, Colombia's was the oldest and by far the most violent conflict in Latin America, got going before the troubles. Um, I know that one can underrate the levels of violence in Northern Ireland. One, when one looks at them in relative terms, they were severe. Uh, somewhere I read that one in 200 families had some, lost somebody during the, during the troubles. Uh, but in Colombia, if you just look at the forced displacement, you had almost one in six Colombians being displaced. And uh, all the other figures that you already heard are, are, are really horrific. The latest uh, from the, what we call the National Center for Memory is a figure of getting close to 300,000 dead, about 80,000 disappeared forcefully, about 40,000 kidnapped, about 24,000, I think 24,500 massacres, imagine that. Um, so it really was by far the most violent country, uh, conflict ever in the Americas. And uh, we managed to put an end to it after an extremely complex and intense negotiation which started in February of 2012 with six months of secret talks. I was the head of the governor's delegation then, and uh, then we did another subsequent four years of public uh, negotiations or negotiations that were known to the public. And in the process, one does learn uh, a thing or two. So to get the discussion today going, I will just mention uh, there are a lot of things we could say, but I'll, I'll concentrate on, on five aspects which I think are uh, possibly especially relevant to peace process today that come out of our own experience. And I'll, I'll do this succinctly because we don't have too much time. Um, the first thing I would say is obvious as it may sound, is that you, you need to, first thing you need to do is you need to structure a process. You need to structure a process. When peace agreements are signed, um, and it happens every so often, not often enough, unfortunately, you get um, the historians and the political scientists, everyone gets their laptop out and they start writing uh, articles explaining why this had to happen. And I say to you, don't believe them, because if you've been into these things, you realize that these things didn't have to happen. Um, they could have gone this way, they could have gone that way. And a lot depends on one's ability to create a structure that channels things, that channels reality in a certain direction. So you finally get the Good Friday Agreement and people say, oh, well, yes, everyone was just so tired of violence in Northern Ireland. Yes, but they were tired 10 years before and 15 years before. And it hadn't happened. Of course, you need. Of course, you need conditions that facilitate, that make it possible. And you may have conditions that make it impossible. But conditions on their own don't get you a peace agreement uh, or a transition, for that matter. If you look at the most serious, by far, situation we have now in the Americas, which is Venezuela, uh, a year ago, 
exactly a year ago, there were, there were very strong signs that something could be done and that there was willingness to sort of sort the problem out. And yet nothing happened. Nothing happened because nobody had actually constructed a structure that took advantage of that moment. And what we have today is an ever more violent stalemate with, as you know, a million Venezuelans in Colombia. UN figures are over three million around Latin America. So mine is just simply a plea for the necessity to construct something. There's a good joke that um, Jonathan Powell, who helped us so much and to whom we're so grateful, often tells from, apparently it's, uh, this is Shimon Peres in Israel in the, sometime in the early 90s, saying, we are finally seeing the light at the end of the tunnel. The problem is that we don't have a tunnel. <laughs> so it, that is the thing, you know, you need to construct the tunnel. In our case, and you have to do a lot of handiwork, and our case was beginning with communicating in a very disciplined fashion through the back channel, which we did between 2010 and uh, 12, then doing six months of secret talks that aimed at a framework agreement. By the way, there were some direct lessons, far and remote as it may sound, there were some direct lessons from Northern Ireland that we used in the way that the preliminary work for the Good Friday Agreement was done and the kind of structures you can set up. Um, we, we took advantage of that and some other examples. And all kinds of simple methodologies because ours were direct talks. We didn't want mediation were direct talks. I'll say a word about the international aspect uh, in a moment. And therefore, we needed to be very uh, rigorous as to how we would set this whole thing up. And suddenly, you notice that things move forward, and uh, you know, you're know you locked up in a safe house in Havana in a room like this with whiteboards, with writing, on, and you notice that the whole thing takes shape, and you notice that you can build from that onto a, uh, something even more ambitious. And, and it is literally like building something building something out of nothing. So I am myself a very big believer in, in, in structuring a, a process. Now, of course, none of this would happen if neither side wanted it to happen, and especially if you didn't have uh, political leaders willing to take the risks. So um, you know, without um, President Santos, none of this would have happened because he, he, he had the vision and he took the risks. Uh, the second element I would mention is the need to put together a new narrative that manages people's expectations and that creates a kind of space within which the negotiation can happen and people can live. I myself attach uh, a lot of importance to this and I say carefully that sometimes it's not obvious to me what the narrative was out of Northern Ireland because one, one sees sort of uh, an amazing achievement and um, a recognition of this principle of consent. But consent is not a narrative. You know, what's, someone wonders, what's, what's the narrative? Uh, in our case, the change was to say, from the beginning to the FARC, that on this occasion after, and remember I should have mentioned at the beginning, that we had had already in Colombia three major failed peace processes, three, in a period of uh, 25 years. Um, and we couldn't risk failing again. We said to the FARC, no, this time we're not going to talk about peace in general, we're going to talk about the end of the conflict. This is what we're aiming for, the end of the conflict. And around this concept of the end of the conflict, we built this little narrative, which, especially at the beginning of the process, was, I would say, very effective. Because, number one, it showed people the Colombian public, that this was somehow different, because we, the end of the conflict was associated with the end of violence, was associated with the FARC's disarmament, so it was like, ah, this is really going to happen. And we actually got a point into the agenda for the first time ever in the secret talks with the FARC called the end of the conflict that included the discussion of the FARC's disarmament. So people thought, ah, this is different. And that was a big guarantee. Secondly, and very importantly, it, it was also a more, a more modest expression than, than, than peace in general. It signaled that it was one thing to sign a, a piece of paper to stop the war, but that building peace was an infinitely more challenging task. 
And that was actually very well received by the communities in Colombia on the ground because peace-building efforts go on all the time. And in a way, people felt acknowledged and recognized in their work, and they do to this day. Um, and, and I think it's good, and especially as uh, Eamon will tell you more about this, but given the enormous challenges of implementation of an ambitious peace agreement, uh, one better be uh, modest about what can be achieved uh, quickly. But also, this, this idea of the end of the conflict was not simply, okay, we're going to negotiate with the FARC how they're going to disarm, because obviously no guerrilla goes to a negotiating table to just sign up to their own uh, extinction. We said, okay, we understand the end of the conflict uh, includes your disarmament, but we also understand that we're talking about the historic armed conflict in Colombia, and therefore we are willing to talk about those issues which we think have a direct relation with bringing a definitive end to the Colombian armed conflict. And for that reason, we are willing to talk about things like rural development or the issue of drugs that have fueled the conflict or the issue of political participation or especially the issue of the victims because there's an association between those problems and the continuation of violence in Colombia. So it gave us a way of defining the agenda we were going to uh, work on, but even more importantly, of giving a kind of conceptual direction, a kind of polar star to what we were doing, which was to say, we are trying here to really uh, attack the problem comprehensively so that we bring a definitive end to the, to the conflict. And it's not just about, uh, uh, there was a, we can talk about that later, it wasn't just about thinking about, okay, what are the so-called root causes, no. It was what are the factors that keep this going, and what and what have been the effects? What have been the effects of this violence that we need to look at? And that was the next point I wanted to talk about: the effects and how to deal with the effects of the violence. Um, and by that I mean not just simply the great issue of peace and justice, which we can talk about later on. I'll, I'll say a word, but uh, more concretely about the effects on a society to suffer those levels of violence for decades. And the conclusion one comes to is that a society that suffers those levels of violence for decades is a society that is traumatized. And you need to face this. You need to acknowledge this. Um, before coming here, I was reading up again on my, some things I have on Northern Ireland. And I came across this paper by an um, Irishman who was teaching in Boston, who um, was speaking on the of 20 years of the Good Friday Agreement and said the following thing. He said, with regard to Northern Ireland, he said, Northern Ireland will never develop to cohesiveness to integrate the disparate parts of its asymmetrical narratives of history, bridge the socioeconomic faultiness, or agree a common accepted policy without an acknowledgement on all sides that post-conflict trauma is of epidemic proportions. And I read that and I thought, ah, oh, he could have been writing about Colombia. It's exactly, but it's extraordinarily difficult for a society to acknowledge that that is what's going on. And that that actually accounts for the behavior of not a few people. So um, what do you do about that? So what we did, and what I always consider to be perhaps, if any, to be the main innovation of the Colombian peace process was to say, from the very beginning of the secret talks, we said to the FARC, we need to have a point on the agenda where we're going to discuss the issue of victims and victims' rights. And this turned out to be by far the most difficult point to deal with. We had to do all kinds of things, from procedural innovations. So we, we had conferences with victims in Colombia that would send proposals to Havana. We, especially with the help of the UN, a university and the church, we brought in five delegations of victims, a total of 60, to Havana. So you had a kind of live truth commission in the middle of the negotiations with victims giving their views on, uh, on the peace process and what should happen. And then we ended up uh, designing what I, I would call the most ambitious transitional justice system to have come out of a peace agreement with a special tribunal, a truth commission, a special unit to look for the disappeared, and with a system of incentives for people to participate on this. Uh, 
which are normally described as incentives uh, based on the idea of truth. So if you tell the full truth of what you've done to the tribunal, you get a reduced sentence under these conditions, but you also have to do reparations, you also have to go to the Truth Commission and various other things. But it's not just, and this is the point I wanted to emphasize, I won't go into the details of all of this, um, but I want to emphasize that the point here is not just the issue of truth in, in a, a normal academic sense, it's the issue of acknowledging the truth that is actually the most interesting and most important. Even the Truth Commission itself has a, as its mandate that it should produce a report on the major violations that leads to uh, uh, clarifying what happened, but also to acknowledging what happened. And that is what you're beginning to see now in Colombia. So we organized, or we helped organize, my office and myself, as Peace Commissioner, but not just us, but various organizations of victims organized uh, very formal acts where the FARC would go before communities and uh, acknowledge the wrong they had done and ask for forgiveness. In very, very moving occasions, uh, the first was perhaps the most moving of all because it was done in a very small town where the FARC had, um, by the way, by the way, with, with some, uh, historically, with some help of some Irish friends, because the FARC, after the famous three that were found in Columbia in 2001, got much better at uh, cylinder bombs and that kind of thing. So they, they, they threw a cylinder bomb in, in the year 2002 in a, in a tiny little hamlet in the most depressed part of Colombia, in the, literally in the tropical conditions in the jungle. And it killed um, 80 people, most, oh, mostly women and children. And it was absolutely traumatic. So they, they came back and the community itself organized this formal act for the FARC to go before them and acknowledge what they'd done. I participated actually formally as well as, as a government and I spoke as a government, but it was centered on the FARC. And this we repeated a few times. More recently, unfortunately, the political events haven't allowed that to happen, but, but that was part of the thinking. How do you start bottom up changing relations by acknowledging what happened. And then top down, you already have, you have a massive discussion in Colombia around the transitional justice system um, because some people don't like what's gonna come out of it. Um, but we already have evidence of um, audiences where, because the system is designed, the one reason why the FARC agreed to do this they agreed to conditions that no other guerrilla has agreed to was because this is, was designed for all who have committed grave crimes in the context of the conflict, it's not just for the FARC, but also state agents, military police, judiciary, and civilians as well. And you already have today in Colombia, according to the press, reports of senior military officials who are sitting in prison and decide to go to this jurisdiction and they're already telling the truth about what happened. Something that actually is very, very rarely happened in transitional justice processes. The, the best known one by far, as you know, in terms of truth is, is South Africa, but hardly any stage agents at all in South Africa chose to go and declare what they've done. So this is actually working, but it's working under huge political pressure, which brings me to my next point, which are the the extraordinary difficulties, and we were talking about that at lunch, of, of aligning political identities with, with the peace process, and of, in general, what I regard as the great challenge of doing a peace negotiation in a democracy. Um, first of all, because um, at a more general level, democracies work according naturally, they just reflect their republics, and in a, in a big country like Colombia, where we had managed to reduce significantly over a period of a, about 10 years the level of violence, by the end, uh, a, a very significant proportion of the population was no longer feeling the direct effects of the conflict. So that actually constitutes a political problem because those who were sitting in the cities have an interest and so forth, but, but they're not feeling it every day. And I find that this is actually probably true of many other places. Um, uh, if I may say so, I'm, I'm not sure that when people were living with what they lived with um, 30 years ago in Derry or wherever, 
anybody in London really, really felt any of this. You know, it, was, it was a different planet. And I was just in Israel a, a few weeks ago, and even the, the whole problem of the West Bank is next door. Nobody in Tel Aviv, you have an impression that really is feeling the pressure of that situation. Well, the more so in Colombia, which is a huge country. Um, so that in itself constitutes a political problem. But more concretely, um, as we were discussing, in, in any democracy that has a conflict of that intensity will necessarily turn it into the center of the political discussion. So that's how political identities are defined, whether you're pro this or against this and so forth. And it makes building a consensus around a solution particularly, particularly challenging. In our case, ended up with a very, very strong opposition to the peace agreement. We, President Santos, we decided, because it was a decision with the FARC, to, um, to do a referendum on the peace agreement. And as you, many of you may know, we ended up losing by 0.3 of a percent in uh, October 2016 by 60,000 votes out of 13.5 million. But we lost. So President Santos immediately went on national television and said, you know, we lost. And um, this happened only three months after Brexit, but with one big difference, which was that in the case of Colombia, those who opposed the peace agreement never said, we don't want a peace agreement, we don't believe in peace. It wasn't a binary situation, yes or no, stay in or out. They said, we have criticisms, we have observations. So when we lost, we said, OK, very well. What are your observations? What are your modifications? That's what they, the word they used in Spanish, modificaciones. And so we proceeded to sit down with them for about a month and take note, build together a document, especially with former President Uribe, who was, uh, led the strongest opposition, to see what the changes were, very concrete changes. And then with that under our arms, we had to go back to Havana and renegotiate the agreement, which was extremely tough. And I have to say, the FARC behaved admirably because from their own point of view, all these changes meant concessions. You know, there was nothing good for them in doing this, but they were conscious of the gravity of the situation. So we actually managed to change in our own count, according to the document we built together with the opposition, 58 out of the 60 uh, issues that they wanted changed. And yet, unfortunately, it wasn't, um, it wasn't enough. And uh, when we came back, uh, we couldn't get to an agreement with the opposition. Um, and the main reason, frankly, and to me was quite obvious, was that in the end, this was a political discussion. It wasn't so much about the peace process, but it was an occasion to build a political base. It was obvious to me that former President Turibi had seen that and had decided that he wasn't going to throw away that political capital, but use it in the next elections, which he did successfully with our new government. So that's what happens uh, when you try and negotiate peace and democracy. Those are the risks you run. By the way, I mentioned Israel, and I'm struck that not enough people notice that everyone know, knows how difficult the issues are, but if you see with the Oslo process, well, what happened to the Oslo process was quite similar. Rabin got killed. Paris very narrowly lost the election that was run partly on opposition to Oslo. So that's fortunately, our situation is better. First, because our um, agreement is much more comprehensive. It's, 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 a, it's, it's a final settlement, unlike Oslo. Um, uh, but also, and this is the last point I'll mention, I'll stop there, uh, to a large extent, because we've had so much support from the international community. Um, we discussed at lunch, we took a particular view of what international engagement should be for us, so we chose to use it very carefully at the beginning during the negotiations. We only asked at the beginning Cuba and Norway for help because they both had experience of dealing with this kind of things, dealing with groups like the FARC. By the way, Amo knows that I don't uh, lose an occasion to tell him and people in your government and foreign ministry that um, I think that Ireland, that has accumulated so much experience because of the Northern Ireland peace process, and it's already doing a lot, but in my view, could do much more with that experience because really there are not too many countries that know how to do this. You can get lots of people who get um, 
MAs and PhDs on P's and, and have, are full of goodwill, but you don't have so many people who know how to operate in these environments. And I know from a few that I've met in this country that you do, so I want to strongly encourage you to engage even more forcefully because I think you have a very rich experience. But just as we kept this kind of minimal strategy of international participation during the negotiations, we were very aware that it would need a lot of international support after the agreement was signed. And it was exactly at that time that Eamon came in as EU Special Envoy towards the end. So he accompanied the end of the negotiation and started preparing the EU for what would come afterwards. And I have to say, this was, of all the international support we have, of course the support of Latin America itself was critical, especially at the beginning of the peace process to get it going and to make it feel that it was something that was built, you know, had the support of the region. But today, the truth is that today, the two most important factors that keep the process afloat in international terms are one, the Security Council, because the Security Council, we agreed, would send a monitoring mission, and this still, the, the mission is reporting to the Council every three months, and so everyone's aware this is going on. And the second is the EU, which has the added advantage, not only of the political support, but of having established a fund to which Ireland has also contributed, as have virtually all of the EU members. So this actually become incredibly important sources of stability in, this, in, this, in the aftermath of the signing of the agreement, which I think are uh, of um, critical importance today. So I will end by thanking um, Ireland again, thanking you for this invitation, and thanking, above all, Eamon Gilmer for his amazing work in Colombia. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. I think that was a, a very clear uh, setting out of the political <coughs> dynamics of the Colombian peace process from somebody who was centrally involved in it. Thank you very much. Amen. <coughs>
uh, but also the leadership of FARC to conclude an agreement. And I think without that uh, political commitment on the part of the main parties in the negotiations, uh, it wouldn't be possible uh, to get an agreement concluded. And I want to pay particular tribute to, and you mentioned it, to the political courage and leadership of uh, President Santos. Because without that, the agreement would not have been concluded. And it was, it was not without political cost to him, um, particularly in the latter part of the negotiations. Uh, his approval ratings were declining very rapidly. I remember one morning, I think it was in uh, June of 2016, I think it was, I think, uh, I think it was the, the date on which the uh, bilateral cease, the formal bilateral ceasefire was uh, eventually concluded and that part of the agreement uh, was uh, signed. And I remember we were meeting before the, uh, the formal event and uh, that morning there was an opinion poll where he was doing particularly badly. I had a certain affinity with this uh, situation <laughs> and uh, I said to him, um, uh, you know, don't, don't, don't worry about the opinion polls. You're doing the right thing. And he said, I know I'm doing the right thing. And he said, even if I'm down to my last percentage point, I will invest it to make sure that this agreement happens. And he did. Uh, and he, uh, I think it is great credit to, to him and to his leadership that uh, the agreement was eventually concluded and that the situation after the surprising defeat of the agreement in the plebiscite, the way in which that was managed, I think was, was very important. But of course, he was going to go out of office. And this time last year, we were, I think, at this stage this time last year, between the two rounds in the presidential election. And it was becoming increasingly clear that the likely uh, winner, as it turned out to be, would be the candidate of the party which had opposed the agreement in the plebiscite. So what was going to happen to this peace agreement uh, following the election of a new president uh, whose party had opposed uh, in, in, the, uh, in the plebiscite. Um, <clears throat> again, this was something that <clears throat> I think we had a little experience of because one of the things that happened here uh, in this state, there was a political consensus around the need to have a peace agreement. Wasn't quite the same consensus in the UK, but uh, I think we do have to acknowledge that, you know, while Tony Blair and Bertie Ahern quite rightly have got the uh, credit for the negotiation of the Good Friday Agreement, that a lot of work was done by people like John Major, Albert Reynolds, Dick Spring, uh, in the years uh, preceding that. And of course, within Northern Ireland, um, eventually Ian Paisley and the Democratic Unionist Party came to work the agreement, and at that stage to participate in the institutions. So from the very beginning, one of the things that I was conscious of was the need to have an engagement with the political opposition in Colombia. Um, Carlos Holmes, who is now the foreign minister, uh, had been the Colombian ambassador to the European Union, and he was known to us, so we had early engagement with him. President Uribe, I had met here uh, when I was uh, Minister for Foreign Affairs, sat beside him at a dinner. Uh, he was here for uh, an event. And I remembered that uh, he had given me, he didn't have a business card with him at the time, but that he had written his email address and contact details uh, on a piece of paper and I had put it away somewhere and I went rooting for it uh, and found it and uh, made contact again and, and indeed had a number of meetings with President Uribe over the period of time and with other uh, figures, including the then Senator uh, Ivan Duque uh, and you know, had a lot of discussions about, well, what if? What if you win the president? You know, what if there is a change of government? How are you going to handle uh, various things? So when President Duque was elected, we were able, I think, to have a conversation with him, um, which was not starting for the first time. It had already built a, uh, a relationship and, a, and a, a dialogue. And one of the outstanding recollections that I have of my work in Colombia was a meeting that I had last October with President Duque. It was at the beginning of, uh, of the week. Uh, I was there for a week. And uh, the first meetings I had was with President Duque. And uh, he said to me, he said, I want to go to one of the ETCRs. These are the places where the uh, FARC ex-combatants are living, the, the kind of settlements where there are two, three hundred of them in, in the different settlements, about 24 of them 
uh, throughout the country. He says, I want to go to an ETCR, and I would like you to come with me. Uh, and I did, and it was a fascinating experience. He was president uh, from the side that had uh, opposed the agreement, meeting uh, FARC ex-combatants, one of them, Joachim Gomez, he was one of the leading FARC figures in the uh, conflict, um, holding a town hall meeting, town hall style meeting, with uh, former combatants, about 300 of them I recall, uh, gathered, asking questions of him. Uh, there was a moment where there was questions and one of the participants complained that not all of the questions were being allowed, that there was a degree of choreography of the question asking, and the president said, well, you know, I'll answer all the questions, and he did. And it was a remarkable um, uh, uh, experience, uh, and it convinced me much more than the statements that were being made to us that the new government was going to implement the agreement, that in fact that there was a real commitment to implementing uh, the, uh, the agreement. And I think that, uh, that that commitment, I think, has been reinforced and supported by the work of the international community. You mentioned the Security Council, the regular reports that go every three months, a report to the Security Council, and a resolution and a statement afterwards, and the unity at the Security Council in support of the uh, Colombian um, uh, the, the Colombian uh, peace process. So how is it doing? Well, largely positive, but um, it's mixed. Uh, there, there are difficulties, there are challenges. There were six chapters in the agreement. It's probably the most comprehensive peace agreement that has ever been uh, negotiated. The sixth one deals with structures and implementation, and that's largely done. Uh, most of the institutions that were to be set up by the agreement have been set up, are functioning. There are some problems here and there, but by and large, they're functioning, including joint bodies that were set up between FARC and the government to oversee its implementation. They're largely working. Chapter 3, dealing with the laying down of weapons, the issue of disarmament and demobilization. Uh, the FARC disarmed within six months, six, seven months, actually. Seven months. They had completely disarmed by the middle of July of uh, 2017. It took seven years here for the IRA to, to, to do the decommissioning of, uh, of weapons, so remarkably quickly. Now, of course, they were just the weapons that the combatants had themselves. Next question is, what happens to weapons that they've stashed away somewhere? There were 900 uh, arms dumps, or calletas, uh, as they were called. By the time the uh, FARC had disarmed themselves, two-thirds of those, over 600 of them, had been handed over to the United Nations uh, monitoring body, and subsequently they were handed over to the government. So the arms dumps have been, uh, have been handed over. The reincorporation or the reintegration of FARC combatants hasn't gone as smoothly or hasn't gone as quickly as we would have liked. There have been delays. Some of the productive projects that we wanted to see and for which we had uh, funding available have been slow uh, in, in starting. There have been some fears that the situation, uh, there was a two-year period which will expire this August where the, the FARC are getting a monthly payment that will come to an end. What will happen to the, the ETCRs? Uh, I think there is a solution um, to that and certainly on my last visit to Colombia uh, I was um, encouraged by the progress that is being made uh, on that. Uh, but one of the things that encouraged me on my last visit was um, the uh, post-conflict minister, Minister for Stabilisation, Archila, told me that, um, that they had conducted a survey of the former combatants uh, to see what did they want, where they were at, training, uh, economic activity, and that of the 13,000 or so between ex-combatants and those that were militia and those that had been released from prison and those that were associated with them, a total potential of about 13,000, that they had got 10,500 respondents. So I put this to uh, one of the FARC leaders afterwards in a meeting that I had with them, and I said, look, uh, government tell us that 10,500 of the former combatants have responded to this survey. And he said, no, that's not true. 11,500 have responded. And I think it gives an interesting measure of you know, while there's been a lot of concern about what is the extent of dissidents who have drifted away from the, the process, I think it's an interesting um, measure of the number uh, who have actually stayed uh, with the, uh, the process, and it's uh, is very encouraging. 
Political participation was, the, uh, was in Chapter 2. number of elements in that. One was that FARC would be, in effect, uh, gifted seats in the Senate, five seats in the Senate, five seats in the Congress. That has happened. There has been a problem with some of the participants because one was arrested on foot of an extradition warrant from the United States. That case is still ongoing. And a second senator, one of the leading negotiators in, in Havana, uh, subsequently left uh, Bogota and didn't uh, take up his seat. Probably one of the disappointing things was that the agreement provided for 16 seats in the Congress to be made available to people from the areas that had been badly affected by the uh, conflict, disadvantaged, remote uh, areas of the country. Unfortunately, and I think this was a consequence of the the fact that the agreement and the, the plebiscite and everything kind of started to move into the election season, unfortunately that provision of the agreement was not approved uh, in, the, um, in the parliament, and I think that's, uh, that's a pity. There's a big provision in the agreement on participative democracy, uh, which I think is quite, quite interesting, and I think it, it, there are a lot of lessons that can be learned from it, indeed not just in Colombia but in other countries. Victims, the chapter on transitional justice is probably one of the most innovative uh, chapters and innovative parts of any peace um, agreement. The institutions, the transi transitional justice institutions have been established. There's a truth commission, there's a missing persons unit, there's a victims unit, there's, uh, and there's the JEP, as it's called. This is the uh, arrangement whereby, uh, Sergio was describing it, whereby people both in the FARC and people in the state system go before the JEP and say, this is what we did. And then, uh, based on their admission, they go before this tribunal, which has the power to impose penalties on them, not in a conventional prison, but it can include deprivation of liberty for, uh, in cases, eight years, 12 years, I think, for some, uh, some, some, uh, 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 some offenses. Now, that has started working. Um, the president uh, said he wanted to make some changes to it, um, didn't sign the statutory law that would uh, uphold it, proposed six changes to it. They, they have gone to the Congress and to the Senate, but the Senate, neither the Congress nor the Senate has up, uh, upheld the six changes, although there is an issue in the Senate about what is the threshold that, for, uh, uh, for, that, um, uh, for that decision. Um, so I think from a legislative point of view, that issue is probably resolved or in the process of being resolved. From a political point of view, I'm afraid it's not because the JEP is still subject to a lot of political criticism within the country and I think that is likely uh, to, uh, to continue. I think there probably will be some progress on that at the point where the JEP starts to actually hand down sentences and actually make decisions and we haven't reached that point yet, and I think that, that will probably change the dynamic. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, I think that the issue of victims probably needs a bit more attention. Uh, victims have high expectations from the uh, agreement. A lot of what victims are looking for, and I spent my last visit to Colombia, I spent a lot of time talking with victims and with their representatives. A lot of what they're looking for is not... Um, you know, not big compensation. They're looking for, I, I mean, I met a group of victims or um, um, in uh, representatives of victims in Putumayo. And uh, what they were talking about was basically the commitments that were made for education for their children. And one woman, woman said to me, she said, you know, all we've got for our children, all my ch child got was three copybooks and a pencil. And so there is work, I think, to be done in addressing the real immediate needs of um, uh, of, uh, of victims. Drugs, as you mentioned, uh, Hergu was a um, chapter in the agreement, and that is a huge problem. The crop, the coca crop, has trebled in uh, recent years. Um, the main source of violence, which unfortunately there is still a lot of in the country, is coming from the drugs trade and from the armed gangs associated with the drugs trade. Um, and uh, we've seen over the course of the last uh, year um, about 180 social leaders, uh, human rights defenders, uh, who have been killed in remote parts of the country and many more uh, intimidated and threatened, largely coming from the, the drugs trade. Now, within the European Union, we've been looking at this, and you'll recall we had an event in Brussels last year uh, 
and I talked about this, about the necessity for, uh, particularly I think in Europe and uh, in North America, for us to look at the drugs issue in Colombia, not just from the point of view of the supply side. We need to recognise that there is a shared responsibility for dealing. We can't just leave this uh, to Colombia and they can't simply be told, you've got a problem with the drugs crop, go and eradicate it. That is not a solution uh, to the, the drug situation. I think here in Europe and in the United States, there has to be a facing up to the fact that these are where the main markets are for cocaine. And if we want to deal with the drugs problem, we're going to have to deal with this on a shared basis with Colombia. And one of the things that we're doing at the moment, we had uh, some discussions about it last week in, in Brussels, is about developing some new initiative to work with Colombia on dealing with the, uh, the drugs, um, uh, the drugs um, uh, issue on a much more shared basis. And then the final issue, which is in the agreement, is rural development and land reform. I'm, I'm somewhat optimistic that the government uh, intends to address the issue of uh, infrastructure in rural areas. And I know that President Duque has been having discussions with the European Investment Bank, for example, who have been uh, who've offered uh, uh, loan facilities to, to help uh, with that. Um, issues around land reform, I, I have to say I'm not so uh, optimistic uh, that uh, uh, things are, uh, are happening or that uh, the ambitions in the agreement are being met just yet anyway, although there is a 15-year time horizon for that. The two big issues that concern me at the, at the, at the moment in relation to the uh, the agreement and its implementation. The first is what I've mentioned earlier, which is the continuing violence in, uh, and it's by no means on the same scale that it was um, during the, the conflict, and particularly at the height of the conflict, but it is continuing in remote parts of the country. It's the, this killing of human rights defenders and of um, uh, social leaders. And on my last visit, because I was there also in my capacity as the now the European Union uh, Special Representative for Human Rights, we had uh, the Human Rights Dialogue, and this was one of the top issues that we discussed uh, with the uh, with the government. The second issue is the deteriorating situation in Venezuela, and the consequences of that uh, for Colombia. And we've already seen very large numbers of migrants from Venezuela. Uh, just to put it in context, we're talking about. Uh, probably all told about one and a half million migrants who have moved from Venezuela to Colombia. That's more than the total number of migrants uh, who came into Europe uh, from Syria, from North Africa, in the height of the entire, and it's into uh, uh, one country on its own. The final thing that I want to say is to echo what you've said, Sergio, which is to uh, acknowledge, I think, the, the very strong support that, uh, that Ireland has given to the Colombian peace process. Uh, and that the government has, uh, the government and the Department of Foreign Affairs have given uh, to the peace process. Uh, the support for my own work uh, through the secondment of uh, an official uh, to work with me in uh, Bogota. Uh, the work of Pat Colgan, who was uh, the former chief executive of the uh, uh, European Funds for uh, Northern Ireland, who worked with the post conflict minister, with Minister Pardo, for uh, a period of time. The fact that Ireland was one of the first member states to join the European Union Trust Fund. The opening of embassies, and Colombian embassy in Dublin and Irish embassy in, um, uh, in, in Bogota, but also the political support. Uh, I was at the Joint Oireachtas Committee recently, and again, it's very encouraging that they're right across the political system here, there has been support for the Colombian uh, peace process, but also there's been active support. We've seen, for example, people like Jeffrey Donaldson, uh, Mark Durkin, um, uh, Connor Murphy, uh, Monica McWilliams, many people from the Northern Ireland uh, process who have gone to uh, Colombia and, and given their, their help and assistance. And finally, I think the, uh, the work, continuing work and continuing interest of civil society organisations in, uh, in Ireland, trade unions, churches, um, uh, development um, organisations, who had an interest in Colombia long before uh, the, in, indeed, even the peace negotiations uh, began, and that interest is, uh, is continuing. And finally, in relation to the European Union's commitment uh, to the process, that continues. Uh, one small correction, Porik, on the introduction. I'm not quite yet the former <laughs> special envoy. For uh, I've, I've, been, I've been given a new job, all right, but uh, Federica Mogherini has asked me to continue uh, with my work uh, on the Colombian peace process until she can find...
a replacement for me in that uh, uh, in that uh, in that capacity. So I will continue uh, working uh, on it. I'm very very happy uh, to um, uh, to uh, to do so. Thank you.